So good morning, everyone. Today we have a, I think, an interesting presentation. In some respects, this is, for me, one of the most important topics in hypnosis in general and in conversation hypnosis, those of you who are interested in conversation hypnosis. How many of you are interested in conversation hypnosis? Just in, that's good, I like that. Because that's my shtick, and if you didn't like it, then <laughs> we'd have a problem, right? <laughs> I, I, the, the topic for today is, I think, one of the most uh, underrated and important uh, concepts in conversation hypnosis and in regular hypnosis as well. I think it's a, a workhorse that does a huge amount of things. The topic, of course, is revivification. Anyone heard of the term before? Yeah? Excellent. Now, I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the term and, and, and contrast it to uh, be a little more clear about what we mean. And in part because in the hypnosis field, there are two terms, revivifications and regressions, which different people flip around and talk about in different ways, right? So I'm going to, in a little moment's time, I'm going to show you which side of the camp I come down on. It, it doesn't matter to me whether you disagree with me and go the other way around. Just switch the terms around so we have the same shared vocabulary. It's more important to me that we have a shared vocabulary than we squabble over one being more correct because it has historical ancestry or whatever. It, it, that bit is less interesting, right? Uh, but I do want to make sure that we all agree on what we're trying to achieve, otherwise it's very hard to achieve it if you're trying to go down this path and I'm trying to show you how this path works. Does it make sense to you guys? Yeah? So before we launch into any kind of major content, let me get a sense of who we have in the room. Uh, first of all, how many people here would say they're already kind of professional hypnotherapists? They're already working with people full time. That's wonderful. How many of you are sort of part time hypnotherapists? You kind of started, you're not quite there yet, but you're getting there. Excellent. How many of you would you say are relatively new or relatively novice at this whole game and you're just here just to figure out what's going on? Good. We'll, 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 we'll cover all our bases. So I, I always try to start from, from scratch, from no assumption of knowledge. So for those of you who've got a little less experience, it'll behoove you to partner up with people with more experience because then you get the really nice um, dynamic, right? You'll get to see what um, other people are doing with this and unconsciously you'll learn more from that. And those of you with more experience, it's actually really, uh, it's actually really valuable to you to find someone with, with as little experience as possible because then you'll get the reactions which are as close to real life and that gives you a much more sense of there are a couple of things we have to tweak a little bit and it works beautifully in, in real life. In here, because we have lots of hypnotists, it gets ridiculously easy because you've already been trained in trance, so it, it gives you a heads up to get started. Um, the distinction between working with someone who's already primed, like a lot of you guys are, or working with someone out there who, who has no idea what you're doing, is very narrow, but there are a couple of nuances where you have to catch when someone's getting off track and how to get them back onto it. And I explain all what I mean by that as we get into the content today, right? So, I call revivification the workhorse of hypnosis because it does so many things, right? Anyone here like the idea of giving clients resources to solve their own problems? Revivification is really the key to that, right? Anyone here think that it can at times be useful to go into the past to either clean up something or to remember something that you used to be good at but aren't necessarily really applying anymore now. Would that be useful at times, right? Revification is that tool. Um, would it be useful to be able to, to collect uh, key memories of someone's life on a theme, for example, when they've learned things in a wonderful way, and chain them up in such a way that the person automatically goes into a super learning state, like a condensation of all those memories? Wouldn't that be useful? Well, that's revification for you. So you can see why I might call this the workhorse, right? Um, I, I, I'm of the opinion that if you understand principles well enough, then any technique can be used to solve any problem. You just have to be more creative about how to apply that technique with the understanding of the principles that you know, plus what the client happens to give you, right? It is useful to have lots of different techniques purely because it gives you different lenses and filters to, to look through to see which one is going to be easiest for that client to work with. But honestly, if you really understand what you're doing, one technique is, is enough, right? And I'm not going to limit you to one technique, of course. And the reason I mention this is, 
uh, of all the, all the hypnotic processes out there, all the processes that I've either developed or, or, or tweaked for our school, if I had to forget everything, I had to lose all my skill, but I only got to keep one thing, this would be it, okay? So, I, I, how many of you came to my other session on the H+, on the whole, um, you know, creating the hypnotic context sort of thing, right? All, everything you learned there will fit here, absolutely. For those who didn't come to that session, that's okay. Um, we'll give you the essence of that as we continue through here. We just won't be able to elaborate on that because I don't have the three hours to do the whole thing again, right? Um, so that's our aim right now, is to look at one thing that if you develop it, uh, it will serve you in pretty much any environment, with your kids, with your friends, with your colleagues, with your clients, with your therapy clients as well as with other people, right? It's a really powerful method. Have I kind of sold it enough to you guys? Yep. Yeah, we are. Are you ready to go? Okay, off you go. <laughs> so let's see what my multicolored pens will do. So, reunification sits in the context of memory, right? Now, memory is a continuum. It, it isn't a fixed thing. You don't either have it or don't have it, right? And in the continuum, over here, you have amnesia. In other words, this is where you forget, right? Now, amnesia, you can have really hardcore amnesia. You have no idea it ever happened. And if someone told you it happened, you'd think they're lying to you, right? Over here, amnesia is more like a block, kind of like the tip of the tongue phenomenon. You know you know it, you just don't have access to it. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? So you can see or really appreciate that amnesia itself is already a sliding scale, right? Then over here, we just have regular memory. That's how you think and do things every day, right? Now again, memories can be kind of vague. You kind of know you kind of had this experience, but it's kind of vague. And memories can be very clear. Once again, you notice the continuum, the, the, the continuum continuing, yes? Then the next layer, excuse me for my doctor-like writing, this actually says hyperamnesia, which I'm gonna write again because I'm not gonna expect any of you guys to read that. Hyperamnesia, is basically a very vivid, very clear recall. Note, hypermnesia begins where memory leaves off. And, and really, the, these distinctions don't really exist in nature. It's just a degree or quality of memory that you have. So when you have a really vivid memory, are you having hypermnesia, or is it not enough to be hypermnesia yet is a really vivid memory? Who knows, and ultimately, who cares, right? As long as we can roughly agree on the continuum, then we'll know whereabouts, what area we want to be working on. Does this make sense so far? Right? Now, hyperamnesia is characterized by very clear recall. However, the emotional component, the physical component of the memory, is still, like in a regular memory, relatively vague, shall we say. Right? Now, as you intensify, you've all had this experience, as you intensified your memories, as you really dwell on something, or maybe something that was unpleasant comes up, you kind of get dropped more into the memory. Somehow the memory comes to life more, right? In hypermnesia, you're clearly remembering something just clearly. In a revivification, which is the next process over here, right? In a revivification, you've enhanced the hypermnesia to the point where you start reliving it, you start having the experience again. And revivification really means reliving. You're starting to relive the experience, right? And this is where some of the terminology gets a little obscured in the industry because the, the, the final piece, which is over here somewhere, and I'll write it up there. So the most intense kind of memory is what I would call a regression. And a regression, not only do you relive the original experience, but you relive it with a consciousness that approximates the one you had back then. I say approximates because there is no 100% in memory, right? But as a rule in a regression, for me what distinguishes a regression from a revivification is in a regression, the client forgets that they had a future past that memory, right? And they have the kind of processing consciousness they had at that point in time. So for example, um, if you regress someone to a five-year-old child, they'll talk like a five-year-old child. They'll have five-year-old mannerisms. You get the idea? Now please note, Revification and regression are flipped around in terms of um, 
how some authors talk about these things. Some authors talk about a regression being just the reliving of the memory and a revivification where you're actually in the memory completely and there's no future anymore, right? I, I'm not really here to, to proselytize one version or the other. Please feel free to keep your own. Just know that when I talk about revivification, I mean the process that sits between hyperamnesia and regression, right? And if you wish to just translate that inside your mind, feel free to do that. It's more that we have a shared vocabulary. Does this little diagram make sense to you guys? Yeah? Okay, so we're going to be doing a lot of work, and because we've got a, a, a limited amount of time, normally I like people to jump around and try different partners and so on, but that creates a lot of chaos in, 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 in uh, the, con uh, the context of training. And normally it's fine if I have an extended period of time because we have time to catch up with that, but here unfortunately we don't. So I recommend that you can look around the room in a moment and decide on someone to partner up with, right? Now you won't know who to partner up with right now because you don't really know who's in the room. Will that be fair to say? So then maybe it's worth going to meet people in the room, right? Before you do that though, seeing as this is a hypnosis training, we might as well have a purpose to meeting people, right? So normally when you meet people, you have the classic things, you know, what's your name, what do you do, where do you come from, that sort of stuff, right? Feel free to do that if you want. However, the, the question I want you to focus on when you meet the rest of the room here today is, um, can you, can you, could you share with me a charming memory, a pleasant memory? And then just let them tell you about whatever it is that they're thinking of. And of course, you guys are probably thinking of something to tell others right now as well, right? And then your criteria is very, very simple. Think about all the people you're meeting, and if you decide, you know what, I like this person, then say, hey, do you want to be partners on the exercises we're going to go through here? You're going to have just one partner that saves us a lot of time having to flip around with different people. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah? So in a moment, we're going to all stand up. You're going to come meet each other. You're going to have a chat. You're going to find out key question. And when you find someone that you're going to enjoy working with, just say, hey, do you want to partner up? And then from that point, just going to hang out together and chat a little bit until we've called everyone back. You have three minutes to meet everyone. All right, so we're going to kick off with a simple exercise, and we're going to add a, a couple of things. Just uh, We'll have part which is the exercise for your learning, and I'm going to add a little piece just to make it easier for everyone to get value out of the room here by keeping the volume a little down so you can actually hear your partners. Is that okay with you guys? That way you guys don't have to, um, you know, especially if you have, uh, have problems with hearing more, we don't override them with too much volume, right? So here's the first exercise. You've actually already done it to some degree. Ask the person about whatever uh, pleasant memory uh, they had, and then just get curious about it and ask them some more questions about it, and notice what happens when you get interested in someone's pleasant experience. And that's really all there's to it. It's not a difficult thing to do, is it? You, you are social people, so you've been doing this all your life in one way or another, right? Do you all understand the exercise I'm asking you to do next? Yeah? Just spend about a minute each, so two minutes in total, uh, to explore the other person's memory, just get a little taste of it, and we'll come back, we'll talk about it, and we'll build on that. Sound good to you guys? Yeah? Off you go. How did I go? Was it interesting? Yes. So a couple of quick questions. First of all, as the client or the person talking about their memory, what did it feel like having someone show interest like that? Was that nice? Yes. Right? Did you notice that, uh, did you notice more information coming out than you had originally anticipated or thought you were going to be sharing? Right? So there's something about the context of someone being curious, being interested, being actually caring and supportive rather than judgmental and, and I guess, vindictive, um, <laughs> that, that opens up the unconscious and gives more information to you, right? That's a good attitude to have. Those of you who've taken the, the H plus training, the, the hypnotic intent training from the other day, use that, that really opens up information, right? The second question I have for you, as you are telling your story, your memory, and the other person was listening attentively with curiosity, maybe asking a few interesting questions. Who here found themselves kind of getting a little more absorbed in your memory? Hands up. All right. Do you see how naturally it is? The, what do you think the principle here is, by any chance? Anyone? H plus is part of it. That's what, what tells the unconscious mind you're safe with me, right? There's another principle that I work with. What makes it more intense? What makes the memory a little bit more absorbing as you're talking about it? Hmm? The mirror neurons, and that's for the hypnotist, getting a sense where the other person's coming from, that's true too. Thank you, this is exactly it, right? So the principle we're working on here right now is this. Don't worry, it's, it's, it's just three letters, so it's fine. It was worth it, wasn't it? 
where attention goes, energy flows, right? And we're not talking about necessarily some mystical energy, we're talking about just simple psychological energy lighting up different neural networks, right? The more you put attention on a particular neural network, in this case it's the memory, the more energy enters that neural network, the more it starts spreading out into its associational field around it, the more information you can get, and the more immersed, in this case in the memory, the person becomes. That makes sense to you guys, right? And that's the little experience you've had so far. So we're going to start using this principle, combined with what you've already been doing, to see if we can start evoking the beginnings of a, a reification, and see if we can start adding layers to make the experiences increasingly intense. Right now, uh, you're probably on the edge of memory and the beginning of hypermnesia. Would that be fair to say? You're getting more clarity of recall. It's interesting, it's engaging, but it's not like you lost track of where you are here and you're over there now. Would that be fair to say? Okay. So for the next uh, few sequences, I'd like you to switch memories for a while. And I'd like you all to select a, uh, a, a, a memory of a really pleasant, formal trance experience that you've had. Right? Now, I understand some of you guys are a little less experienced, so does anyone here not think that they have a formal trance experience that they could use as a memory? Hands up. Right? So you guys have a little issue, you're not quite sure if you have a formal trance experience? Excellent. Uh, believe it or not, you have an informal one, which is just as good. But for the moment, I encourage you two simply to think of a memory where the, the following qualities were present. Very calm, very kind of calm or relaxed, and very focused on something, right? So kind of absorbed by something. Could be reading a book, could be watching a movie, could be uh, you know, watching your kids sleep, whatever it is that kind of makes you feel very peaceful inside, but also very focused on whatever your object of attention is. And if you, do you have a memory like that in mind that you could use, yes? Perfect, good. So that'll be your substitute for now, right? Everyone else, please use a formal trance experience for the first step, and we'll see how we can then enhance that as we go along. Sound good to you guys, right? So the object of the following, the next exercise is have exactly the same conversation again, only this time focus on the trance experience. And hypnotist, whilst you're being hypnotist, just watch the body language of your client as you enjoy the conversation. I'm not asking you to look for anything uh, specific, but if something interesting pops up, then we'll talk about it afterwards. Sound good to you guys? Question. Yes, sir. Oh, madam, sorry. Say again? What do you mean by uh, Would you like to go into hypnosis? Yes, please. All right. Off you go. <laughs> That's formal. Right? H have you had someone formally hypnotize you like that, and I look at my hand and do this, something like that? As long as it was pleasant, go for that. And by the way, if you get it wrong, who cares? I'll never know. It'll still work. <laughs> Off you go, guys. So how was that? Was that interesting? Did you enjoy that, right? Comparing your experience, both as client and as hypnotist, this round, compared to the other memory, the more generic uh, positive memory, do you have any interesting differences that you can detect? Go ahead. More emotive, right? I'm presuming the second memory was more emotive, right? Um, we'll come to, actually, we'll come, we'll come back in a second. Why do you think this memory was, generally speaking, more emotive, had more emotion in it? Any ideas? <laughs> she had tears in her eyes, and then I just asked her about it. She said, oh, I had something in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> so she's saying she had tears in her, her partner had tears in her eyes when she asked about it. She says, oh, I just had something in my eye. It's okay. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, the, the memory, the quality of memory we're pulling up right now has has, first of all, the characteristics of less consciousness, less conscious mind interference, and therefore you're more plugged into the unconscious world, which includes emotions, right? So as a rule of thumb, the more, quote-unquote, unconscious they are in an experience, which basically has to do with the quality of experience they have, the more immersed they are in the experience, the more unconscious they are, the more vivid the memory can be once you start bringing it to life. And these are just the opening salvos, but already some interesting things are happening, aren't they? So thank you for that. There was a hand over here, yes? So you had a physical reaction as the client, yeah? Describing to me the moment he saw his wife to be. Uh -huh. And that moment, I had a thing, and I actually had, I had chills that day. Awesome. It was awesome. So, so his partner was uh, described the moment that his, he saw his you know, prospective wife across the room and just recognized this is it, and that gave you shivers down your spine. Mm -hmm. It's excellent, and may I recommend that for the next exercise you specifically choose a trance experience, a formal trance experience you've had, it'll make the exercise a little bit simpler for you, 
and then you can come back to these kinds of memories. We will come back to how to activate these amazing memories as well. Is that okay with you guys? You don't have to do it. You'll just make your life a little bit easier if you do for the first few steps, okay? Thank you for sharing that, awesome. Go ahead in the back. So uh, just slow down a little bit because I, I can, it's, um, so what can you do too? So these, what, what do you mean by desensitizing down? Yeah. So are you talking as a hypnotist here? So if you're the hypnotist talking to your client yes. and you get too absorbed in the client's story, yes. you kind of lose track of what you're trying to do. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't finish the feeling of it. Absolutely. Um, well, let's see if we can start getting some, some uh, technical things around which will pull you back to doing a task. Right now, you don't have clarity on what tasks to do. We're just having a conversation. And this is your, obviously your normal conversational style, which is actually a very good style to absorb yourself in the other person's experience. We'll start putting in specific things for your conscious mind to keep track of, which should give you a, a guiding theme, but we're not there yet. We're just building up the foundation slowly. If the, th the things we do doesn't solve that for you, then feel free to come back and we'll see if we can fix some things there then, okay? Any other comments or questions what you've done so far? Interesting, oh, okay, go ahead, yeah. So you can already tell that they're beginning to relive the sensation part of the experience, right? And it was also related to music, and I felt like her rhythm changed. Oh, interesting. So it was related to music, so it felt like her rhythm changed. Now, rhythm's very powerful, it's very important. It's unfortunately not something you have time to get into today, but seeing as it's already coming up, note it and start using it, because it's, it's a very powerful thing, yeah? So notice, guys, you are here, of, of course, we have created a hypnotic context here. You have an expectation of trance in this room, that's why you came to the seminar, right? And that's important for you to realize that the expectation is there because within that expectation, just by asking about a trance memory and being generally curious, you're automatically beginning to, uh, uh, we've started going past. I'm gonna go here. In this last exercise, even though we, we were still really early days yet, can we really say we're stuck on just a regular memory or something a little different? Something a little different? A little more, how many people here, hands up if you think you entered a hyperamnesia, so a very clear memory as you went through. Cool. Hands up if you thought you actually entered a revivification, at least the early stages, we started feeling it as well, right? Now, I'll check anyways, but I doubt this will be true. Anyone here completely you go regress and uh, forget that you were in this room, you were actually having the experience again? No. We haven't done enough attention setting to do that. Does that make sense to you guys? But already, cycling the attention is having quite a profound impact, isn't it? So, I'd like to see what happens if we can find some tools to get that attention focused uh, even more and still doing it in relatively conversationally. I don't mind if it's a little formulaic right now. We'll hopefully have time enough at the end to make this totally conversational, but semi-conversational would be good for now, right? The tool I'd like you to use right now is very simple. It's a phrase like, tell me more. Right? Now, of course, you've been doing something like that already. Hands up if you have asked questions like that already during the last set of memories, right? Why? Because you were interested about whatever they were saying, right? <coughs> All I'm going to encourage you to do now is to increase the frequency. So whenever they give a bit of um, a memory, go, oh, that's really interesting, tell me more. And I'll tell you some more, and you go, oh, wow, tell me more. Your job is to tell me more of them until they say, that's it, that's over, the memory that's where the memory finishes, right? So you just get them to keep going until the end point, and then that point you'll switch roles and we'll come back and have a little chat about that. Feel free to depart from the tell me more questions. If something really curious, asking, oh, that's really interesting. Well, tell me more about that, which is fine too, right? Don't get too rigidly stuck on the language. The stuff you were doing already is good. I'm just giving you more of a guideline so you can focus in on maintaining the story that they're telling you. Does that make sense to everyone, yeah? Okay, so it should be relatively sim similar to the last exercise, but hopefully you'll see a couple of nuances that we can talk afterwards. So hypnotists, as you're doing this, just try, try and compare how they respond now to compare to how they responded on the similar exercise a few moments ago. Okay, guys? Off you go. Was that interesting? How'd it go? Good. So comparing the previous version of the exercise to this one, they were very similar, right? What differences did you spot? What changed in the second time around? Any ideas? Go ahead. More details of the memory for sure. Anyone else kind of notice that, yeah? What other things do you notice? 
more connection with the person telling the story, right? Notice how as your curiosity arises and you actually generally take time to be with that person. And this whole idea of tell me more is basically saying, don't worry, I'm not going to fear with your memory. I'm not going to tell you how cool my memory was, which is the normal social thing, you know. Oh, you go fishing, you tell, let me tell you my fishing story. Mine was way bigger than yours, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why men fish, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you see the point here, right? You're giving a very respectful space for the other person to be heard, to be listened to, and that's actually very powerful, right? And so we start automatically getting trans-supporting element, hypnotic-like elements starting to slip in naturally. And if we can start enhancing them, well, we have the perfect recipe for a conversational trance. Is this making sense to you guys? We want to build up to it and just trying to sh make sure that you see how every little bit you're adding is slowly enhancing the quality of the memory and moving it towards a full revivification. Make sense to you guys? Go ahead. I got to the point where we were talking to where I normally would end the story. Yeah. So he's saying that he got to the point in his own story where he would normally have stopped, and then when the question, tell me more, came out, suddenly the story opened up again, and it became richer, and it seems to be more intensified, right? And how did you feel that second time when you were, thought you'd stop, but you carried on anyways? Did you notice a little quality of a deepening, like it was more enriched as a result? Very much. Right? Because this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to exhaust the conscious mind, because the conscious mind thinks it knows, right? But the unconscious mind really knows. So once we've exhausted the conscious mind, what it thinks it knows, then we get down to business. You get the idea? And typically, as new information comes up, surprising information starts to come up, you know that you're increasingly entering unconscious territory. And as soon as you're in unconscious territory, you know that a regular memory is already beginning to formulate into a revivification. It's the, the opening salvos, so to speak. And look how easily and how quickly you manage that. It wasn't really difficult, was it? Right? And of course, the, the, there'll be uh, easy clients and more difficult clients, and we'll talk more about how to handle different things. But for now, it's actually relatively simple, right? So the next thing I want to do is we're going to go the same story again, right? Same client, same story. And this time, you're going to go through your tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, until they kind of run out of story. So I'm going to get a little bit longer this time. Now, when they say, that's it, I've run out of story now, then your job as a hypnotist is very simply to go, all right, so then let me check. So it started in, and you just basically uh, repeat whatever the beginning of the memory was for them, and then ask them, so what happened next, right? And then you're doing the same tell me more again. You're just going through the exact same cycle a second time just to see what happens, right? So you've gone one cycle of the memory. It's come to an end. You extend it a bit, and then it comes to a more unconscious end. And they say, that's it. I've got nothing left on this one. So you go, great. Let's go back to the beginning and remind them what the beginning was, and then Again, tell me more. What happens next? Keep going. So you do the whole cycle again and see if something interesting pops out of that. Any questions on that? Yes? Is this story about the formal trance? The formal trance, absolutely. The formal trance experience, yeah. We will, we will take other types of memories in due course. It's just the formal trance is the easiest to get started with because it's, it's got a clear delineation. It's a clear start and a clear ending, hence formal. You get the idea? If you want to explore other ones, by all means do so. You'll just, it'll just um, muddy the water a little bit, so it'll be a little less easy to get clarity. But rest assured, we'll end up with all kinds of non-formally hypnotic memories. Does that help? Any other questions before we start? Hey okay, guys, off you go. So, was that interesting? Yes. Yeah? Do you notice a distinction this, this, this time around to the previous exercises? What kind of distinctions do you notice? Yes, sir. Eye contact is way less. It's definitely more. Eye contact from the client is way less. It's more off the side. Why do you think that is? Because they're accessing the memory. Because they're accessing the memory. I, I, I begin to notice that the more you emphasize the memory, the less they're in this room with you, and the more they're inside themselves somewhere, beginning to live. Who here started getting, who here touched on a reification today? Who here started to feel like this is, yeah. I'm really going to feel this now. Do you see what's happening? We haven't even done any formalized hypnotic techniques around it or hypnotic context. It's purely attention and curiosity that brings everything together. Does that make sense to you guys? And already you're finding people trying to remove themselves from the out outside world so they can inwardly orient their trance. It's a very Ericksonian concept. And it's happening spontaneously. It's wonderful, right? Thank you for that. Yes, sir. So you felt your interaction was more of a conversation. So how come? 
Yes, yes. Abs separation. Absolutely. So this is, this is important, right? Um, you can do reunifications conversationally, but not in a conversation. And here's what I mean by that. Um, in order for the attention, this, the attention principle to work, you need to accumulate the attention. Now, every time that you share part of what you're doing, then you are distracting them from their attention. Sometimes it's important to throw a little story in there to assist, but usually, when people, when, when you're having a conversation, they say something and you say something, you're really wanting to add to the conversation so that you get valued by them. And that's not your job as a hypnotist, to be valued by them. Your job is purely to focus on their experience and enhance it as much as possible. So if you find yourself getting in backwards and in forwards, you're actually breaking the, the chain of flow, and you never have quite the energy to build up a momentum, right? It's kind of like, um, um, like a ski jumper he needs to build up some momentum before he jumps off the slope, because if he tries jumping from the end of the slope, <laughs> he's not going to go very far, right? And, and reunification works the same way. We need to accumulate attention on the, the, the source, and the more attention we accumulate, the more they progress through the types of memories until it hits the reunification we're looking for. Does that make sense? And it's important that you, and it's, 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 it's a good experiment to have done, because then you notice that once you left the formal process, it lightened the mood again. He didn't, wasn't quite as engaged in the memory anymore. It didn't quite light him up as much anymore. It was more conversational again. In other words, the conscious mind started being more present again. Does that kind of fit the scenario you had? Yeah? yeah. So it's good to know. You, you do want to resist the chit-chat style of conversation at this point. Although, hopefully if there's enough time today, I'll show you how to start with a chit-chat and end with a reification, and no one even know what happened in between. Okay? So the chit chat is not at the end, it's at the start. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yes, sir? So he's feeling more and more like he and his partner are in a bubble and the rest of the world is somewhere else, yeah? And it's taking increasing effort for them to shift direction, come back, or do other things. Anyone else noticing this? You know you're getting it right when you have this feeling that this momentum that you're building up feels so good, you don't want anyone else interfering with it. It's like, just get out, let me do my thing, <laughs> right? Which is exactly what you want, especially if you don't do this conversationally. You want the person, your conversational partner, to be so engrossed in this, what they think is a conversation, but actually is a reunification on your part, that they will themselves ignore what's going on. You should be able to, once you get good at this, to sit downstairs in the casino with all the bling bling lights, they won't even know, right? It sounds odd, I know, but in fact, I think you've seen this already happen, right, Benjamin? Right, on a, on a different session? So they will, you can literally translocate the client. They will have a hallucination of the memory and have no concept that they were here during that time, totally conversationally, and then when they come back again, unless you point out that they've been somewhere, they still don't know they just spent a chunk of time in a different universe, right? It's a very odd backwards rationalization the mind makes. But we're not there yet. That's something we're working towards, and hopefully we have enough time in this session. Thank you for that, Benjamin. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead. Just to the echoing, I found it very powerful. Like it's almost like you're ratifying their experience, and every time you echo something back or talk right. about a clean language, they feel this compelled to just give you more right. and more. So, so this is a concept we're about to get onto, so I'll share with you anyways, but this is exactly where we're heading now. He's using the next step of the process, which is the echo effect, to echo back elements of the language, and he found that that was much more profound, and it intensified everything much more. So congratulations, you just did the next exercise, but I like it. Very good. Any questions about the process so far, or are you all seeing this pattern? There's a trend for the interaction to become increasingly hypnotic as you go along. Would that be fair to say? So you may have noticed that the way we just set it up a moment ago, where you, end, you run through the story until it's really ended, and you go right back to the beginning again, do you notice how in that second round, more information again came out that wasn't there in the first round? Anyone notice that? Hands up. Right? It's very natural. Do you also notice that both you and your client were more absorbed in the story the second time round, as long as you asked it with a genuine spirit of curiosity? I, I call it the Colombo approach. It's like a little humble, like, let me just get this straight. You know, you said you started here, and then what happens, right? It's a, it's, it shows genuine curiosity and interest. But it takes time, right? It took you almost five minutes to get to the point you're at, and we're not even fully revivifying everyone in the room yet, right? We're not, we don't want to spend an hour going through the same memory loop over and over and over again, because there's a point of diminishing returns. So would it be interesting to start exploring a way of getting the same impact, actually a deeper impact, 
in less time. Would that be of interest to you guys? Yeah? So we're going to do the same thing again. You're going to ask them about their memory. You're going to keep going to tell me more and tell me more. Don't, don't worry about the echoing and all that stuff yet. We'll, we'll talk about that after the break. It's an extra, uh, it's going to be a little extra time. Only this time, as you are saying, kind of tell me more, I want you, the hypnotist, to just pause them. If they have too long, if they're like, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, just pause them in between and go and slow them down. So, okay, just pause a second. So all this happened, now tell me more, right? So you're basically slowing them down with your speech, with pauses, and just getting them to slow down and kind of, instead of, think of a person eating a meal, they could just hoover it all up, or they could begin to slow down and actually appreciate each portion of the meal. And you're getting them to appreciate each portion of their mental experience. Does that make sense to you guys? However you wanna pause them is fine. Uh, we will give you more techniques or tricks around how to do that eloquently in time. But right now I just wanna see the impact that that has. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm trying to bring it out. Yeah. So what's I'm not the to pause it. I'm trying to So may I ask what the memory is? Uh, I went to the trance during the hypnotherapy training. So you went into trance during hypnotherapy training? Where, where was this? How how far ago how long ago was that? Uh, two thousand three. Two thousand three, okay. And how long a trance was it? Uh, it was probably a ten minute trance. Like a ten minute trance, right? So about I don't know, twelve years ago roughly, is that right? So around twelve years ago. Uh, where, where where was this by the way? In San, near San Francisco, right? Marine County. So you're in Marine County about 12 years ago, and you had an interesting hypnotic experience there that lasted about 10 minutes, is that right? Right. So how did that hypnotic experience begin? Uh, the instructor was in the front of the room. So, just, so you have the instructor in the front of the room, and you're not yet on the front of the room, right? Well, I'm on the floor. So you're, you're on the floor already? So you're already in trance or not? Oh, no. Just so how do you get to the floor? Oh, wonderful. So you were in a, in a training, and I was working with a whole group. Yeah. So you're part of a whole group. He asked the whole group to get comfortable, right? Right. So the whole group's getting comfortable, and you chose to get comfortable by lying on the floor. Is that correct? Yeah. So you're lying on the floor, and you're waiting for your instructor to begin to start whatever he's doing. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so you're in the group in Marina County. You're lying on the floor now with everyone else in the group. What happens next? How does the instructor begin? I don't remember exactly what he said. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he does whatever normal induction he does. Right. Then... So how, how do you know the induction is beginning then? How did you know that, oh, something's happening right now? I just hear his words. So you hear his words, right? And, and how do they sound? Do you see what's happening right now? Right? Now, I'm adding a few extra bells and whistles because this was more of an awkward memory for you. So uh, the things you're seeing me doing right now, we will build up towards. But let's answer your question for the moment, yes? How did you experience that compared to what you were doing before? Well, I had to go inward. Right? You had to go inward. Do you see those words? This is exactly the same words we had over here. This is very important. If, they, if, if your client, and some, sometimes you get this, if your client wants to entertain you, and it's like, oh yeah, I did this and that so on, then they're trying to control the conversation, which doesn't allow them to appreciate the conversation, to, to uh, wallow in it, shall we say. And your job, and this is what we're doing with these pauses right now, um, we just may have run out of time for the break, so we may do this after the break. Your job is to slow them down enough and reorient their attention back on the constituent elements of that memory enough. Remember, where attention goes, energy flows. Could you see the energy of his attention going to the memory more and more? Could you see him begin to slow down and internalize? Could you be seeing the beginnings of, a, of trans signals coming out? We weren't fully blown there yet, but would it be fair to say that was a more intensive version of the experience than you had previously? Do you get the idea, right? So we're gonna just slow people down and get them to start appreciating their own memories, and that automatically kicks in the revivification process. Make sense, everyone? What I'd like you to do now is I wanna start introducing pauses. You want to, the, the, the key to making this really work is to slow the person down. The more they slow down, the more they'll tend to appreciate and, and uh, uh, spend time appreciating their own memories, the quality of the memories, which of course enhances the effect. Did, so what's your name, sir? William. William. Did you notice William trying to race off a little bit and me slowing him down again? Yes? You notice that it's by interrupting his train of thought, which is the thing that's keeping him out of trance, 
and slowing him down to my train of thought. Can you begin to feel something happening, right? So this is very important. So what I like you to do now is go back to, with your partners, ask them about their trance memory again, and as they start describing it, just interrupt them so there's only one unit of information. Now, what is one unit of information when a story comes out, right? It's simply one idea that you can log in your mind. Well, it happened last Tuesday. Okay, let's just pause there a second. So what happened on Tuesday? Well, I was in a seminar, whatever it is, and the instructor said I want to lie down. Okay, so let's pause a second there. And then you just recap. It was Tuesday, you're in a seminar, and you're all getting ready for trance. Is that right? So you notice I'm just checking in with them. It looks like I'm trying to make sure I understand his story but actually I'm slowing him down so that he spends more time at each step of the story. Do you understand what I'm asking of you? Yes, guys, right? Any questions about that? Yes, sir. I know you, you got him here right at the foundation start. Yep, so he's saying he noticed that I got him right at the, um, at the start of the whole storyline, right? Yes, because I mean I, I can start anywhere. It's just I want to, uh, especially because he said it's a really short story and I can't go anywhere. Then I want to have as much mileage as possible, right? Although typically speaking, memories do have beginnings and middles and ends, right? If uh, and this is going to a different, more therapeutic idea, most trauma has a beginning in the middle of the trauma and an end before the trauma is finished, which is why they're traumatized. And if you can expand their memory so it begins with them being safe and ends with them being safe, it reframes the entire memory and it de-traumatizes. In this context, because we're learning a, a related but different skill, what we're looking to do is, we're looking where does his memory naturally start with it? Because like everything else in life, it starts off slowly and whoosh, takes off, and we want to catch the momentum for the taking off because somewhere in that momentum, um, his unconscious mind will take over and then we'll see the chances that erupt as a result. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions before we start? Are you all clear on what you want to want to be doing? You're asking for the same story again, only this time you will pause them. If you need to physically touch them, by all means do so. Um, you want to pause them so that you can then make sure that they only give one piece of information at a time and really take time to appreciate that little piece. And they won't know how to appreciate it unless you show them, which means you slow down a little bit and go, okay, all right, I get that, so it's there. So what happens next? You see how I'm, I'm modeling a little bit the inward orientation, the, the reflective nature of this uh, experience? You get the idea? Do you all have a good sense of what to do in the exercise, yes? All right, guys, off you go. So how did that go, folks? Was it good? How, this, how did this round compare to the previous one? Go ahead. You had to pay a lot more attention. Now, you notice as hypnotists, you have to be a little bit more on the ball because you can't just let them roll on their own terms now, right? What happens if you lose a little bit of attention or a little bit of control? What happens to your client at that point? They just keep running and running and running, which means they go at their pace, which is at the fast food pace rather than at the slow appreciative meal pace. Does that make sense? So thank you for that. So who noticed they had difficulty pausing the client? Hands up. So what kind of difficulties do you run into? Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Do you mind sharing that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I didn't interrupt him enough. So she's saying you didn't interrupt him enough. And do you know what caused you or what, what, what held you back from interrupting sufficiently? Well, I was concerned I didn't want to parrot him all the time. Thank you. So there's a concern that she didn't want to parrot him all the time. She didn't want to insult him by going like, uh, you know, I went to the trance. Oh, you went to the trance. I went to the trance. Oh, you went to the trance. <laughs> right? <laughs> That would obviously be annoying. I get that, right? So I'll take some more uh, comments in a moment. But uh, the reason I mention this specifically is because I'd like to show you a method, you've actually seen it, that will allow you to do this parroting without parroting, which is it's going to feel... Let me ask you this. Did you feel insulted when we talked? No. Right? Did you feel I was just parroting or aping what you were saying? No. No? Did it seem more like I was trying to understand your experience? Yes. That's the key right there. Right? And we'll show you how to do that shortly. But I did want you to get the experience of this because the more conversation you get, the more wild the conversation becomes. And then your, your, your job as a conversational hypnotist, if you want to go down that road, is to contain or constrain the conversation again so it's channeled 
down the channel, the attention channel, that will lead to the outcome that's going to best serve that person. Do you get the idea, guys? Overall, as a big picture. So there's a comment over here, yes? You felt some selfishness as a client or the hypnotist? Uh, as a hypnotist. Okay. Uh, because she was so involved with the experience to make her focus on one that they might, you know, revivify or apply Okay. So, so you felt a little selfish because of her experience was so vivid that you felt you were interfering with that? Is that right? Or something else? And, and let me ask you this. When you did pause and do the whole, you know, starting over thing again, did that diminish her experience or did it enhance the experience in some way? Ask her. You won't know. <laughs> so if I can turn straight to your partner, is it all right if I ask you directly? Is that okay? So when he was interrupting you to pause you and slow you down a little bit, did it enhance your memory or did it detract from it? Did you just like, just stop talking because I'm enjoying it too much for my own? Okay. Got it. Wonderful. So, so you're, in a, you're in an interesting position at this point, right? Because you actually got the reification naturalistically. I'm suspecting because we've gone through the memory so often, her unconscious mind going, yes, I'm here already. And at that point, of course, you're right, putting interference there. It's kind of like, anyone here ever push a child on a swing, right? What happens if you push at the wrong point? You push the child off a swing, right? <laughs> and that can happen here too, so you're correct. Timing the interruption is important. That's going to be something you'll, you'll get with experience. So the sense you have is excellent. The only danger is if you let the client keep running on their own experience, they'll want to be in a wonderful trance, it just doesn't include you, right? And it's very difficult to steer someone's trance the more they're excluding you to have their experience. Uh, and so um, I'm going to show you a way to respectfully intensify the experience while slowing it down so she'll get more out of it. It'll enhance that. So she'll be willing to pause because it's like, hey, did you notice that this meal has this wonderful little thing? Oh my God, I did. I love cherries. The cherries, I'll, I'll stay here, right? That's the kind of a, a experience you want them to have where they actually enjoy being paused because more comes out of that memory. Would that be fair to say that was your, your experience, William? Right? Does that make sense to you guys? Does that answer your question? Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Question. Um, what happens? It happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And then you experience the same thing like uh, heartbeat, irregular heartbeat. Oh, so, so, involved, right. So if, if I can just translate for the group and tell me if I got the question right. Yeah. What happens when you're talking to someone and they're very engaged, you're very engaged in the experience yeah. and you start mirroring their experience, whatever story they're telling you, you're, you're feeling. Yeah. And it seems at the end that you talked about what if part of that experience is unpleasant and you start mirroring that unpleasant part of the experience. Is that the question? Yeah. Great. First solution is, don't ask about trauma. It's rare that revivifying trauma will be of value, right? Uh, you will have to do a little bit to solve the trauma, but nowhere near and intensify. Unless you want to go to evil hypnosis school and really mess people up, don't revivify trauma because it'll re-traumatize, right? So if you're at a point where the memory starts getting unpleasant, then you need to redirect the attention towards other portions of the experience, or better still, choose an unambiguous experience, one that's purely positive. Does that help, or am I missing something? No, I'm missing something there. Yes and no. Yeah, what am I missing? If I have to deal with those things. I deal with yeah, yes, yes, yes. Day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, can I answer this in a sim much simpler way by doing a role play? Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, do, you want, do you mind coming up and being the client? Give me a round of applause, guys. <laughs> can I close the chair? So I'd like you to role play one of your clients, and, and I'll, I'll play you in terms of how to deal with that situation, right? Okay. So if I understand you correctly, your clients have trauma, and you have to deal with that trauma, and you'd like to be able to apply this to helping that trauma. Is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. So I'll be the therapist. So hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, so what's up? How can I help you? OK, I have that things happened to me, and yeah. I had those um, yeah. heartbeats, irregular yeah. ones. Yeah. And I was okay. so involved yeah. in that. Now, this, I presume, is something you would like to fix. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> I understand that. Before we look at that a little bit more, I need to get a little bit more about you, right? What do you do for a living? Pardon me? What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a physician. You're a physician? Excellent. And um, that, must be, that sounds like it's quite a stressful job, am I right? Or am I just reading too much into it? No. There's a bit of you stuff going on. It, but, uh, you deal with it, right? How do you deal with it? Just you do your job. 
you do your job and you kind of ignore the pressure and so on? Or do you actually do things to relax to kind of decompress? Yep. What, what do you do to decompress then? Physical jogging. Jogging, yeah. Do you like jogging? Workout, yep. Yeah. Hiking, so of all those things, which one's your favorite? All of them. All of them? So well, let's, let's take jogging, since you mentioned it first. What does you like about jogging? When you relax. When you relax. You kind of get tense and get so, relaxed. So you kind of do what things? Get tense. You get tense, right? And Together, and then as you're running, you relax more? Relax more. All right, so just help me understand this. So um, uh, do you jog every day, is that right? Did you jog, jog yeah, today? Try to do as yesterday much, I did, yeah. Yesterday you do jogged? Much, yeah. Okay, good, good. So <laughs> just walk me through it. Um, when does the jogging mindset start? Do you start in the house, or do you just find yourself in the middle of the run? It depends. Let's say you yesterday. outside. How, how did it happen yesterday? Yesterday on the treadmill, it's too hot. Oh, you on the treadmill yesterday, right? So when did you decide to start jogging yesterday? Evening. In the evening. So you had a long day at work, maybe a little bit of stress there and stuff like that, and you yeah, came home? Here and got it. Too much absorption. So then you, got, you, you were home, and did you decide to go jogging straight away, or was something that you yeah, just no, live with? I usually plan to do it. Oh, wonderful. So you planned it straight away? Yeah. So you get home, did you get changed first, or did you just run in your work clothes? No, no. no. You get changed, right? Yeah. So you're at home, yep. and it's yesterday. Yep. You've got home. You change straight away. Uh, yeah. You change straight away. Yep. Uh, you put your running shoes on, obviously. Yes. You go on the treadmill. On the treadmill. And how how do you begin? Do you start walking? Do you start running? No, or? I start running immediately. You start running immediately. Yeah. And how do you feel when you start running? I feel good. You're feeling you good. Start good, right? And then you run more, more intense. More so you intense. had you start on the running track. Yep. And you're feeling good because you're starting straight to running yes. and you've had a lot of experience of this. So it's a natural rhythm to find. Yep. And you get into that rhythm yep. and you do more running. Yes. And does it get easier as you run further? It, no, not always. Not it always. What about yesterday? Yesterday was difficult to run. Yesterday was difficult to run. For some reason, I don't know why. For some reason. Okay. All right. So when was it easy? When you get to a certain Thank point. Thank you. Yeah. Then you yeah. Kind of Give me an example. Give me an example of when that happened, a specific day. Let me just pause a second. Do you know why I'm doing this? He's going to abstraction. It's very hard to verify an abstraction, right? It's not a memory, right? So can you give me an example of? I was really vivid. Uh, really vivid, yeah? Really vivid for me when I overstepped that moment. Runner's high, I never experienced before. Oh, cool. So how, when was this? Very hot day. It's so a very hot run, day. Run was very difficult. Can, can you just pause you a second? Uh, was it recently or was it a while ago? It was a while ago. Roughly how long? Some four or five years ago. See, so I'm orienting in time right now, right? So about four or five years ago, you, have a, you decide to have a run just like every other run. Yep. Uh, but it's a really hot day, right? Really hot day. So you're going to have a normal run. Okay. Normal run. It's a really hot day. You know now, of course, that something really cool is going to happen, but you didn't know it at that time, right? No, not at all. So how did you start running? Somebody involved me. Oh, that day? Yeah, that day. that day. I started running like usually. And so you were running outside? You I, out of your front door? Yes. I underestimated that day. It's too hot. <laughs> you underestimated the temperature for the day, right? And I was going. And, and you were going? Going around already. And right. So just, just pause a second. So it's a hot day. Hot day. You underestimated the heat, yes. but you're already wearing your gear. Yes. And you're already running. Running. So what keeps you going? Do you decide you might as well keep going because I'm there? Or? Yeah. No, no, I didn't. No, you didn't even think about it, you just, no. you just ran. I just ran. So you're in your zone, you're just running, running and, and it's hot and it's really hot. And then what happens? And then I feel, okay, I cannot do the next step even. So, so you get really, is it tired, is it exhausted, is it, what is that, what would you call it? Exhausting. So it's something so exhausting, so you're running and it's extra hot and you're getting really exhausted and you feel, so I, I can't run another if step. If I step next step, I yeah. fell down and yeah. that's it. And yeah. say, okay, I did that next step. Yeah. And, and then what happened? Opened. Oh, tell me about that. Oh, that was nice. Something yeah. opened, right? Something opened. And you didn't expect it, right? It gets so easy. Right. Breathing so easy. So, so you're running, and it's getting really hard, and you get to the point where you just can't take another step. Not even one. And step. suddenly something opens. Yeah. Something opens, and it becomes really easy. Easy to run. Really easy, easy to run. Easy. Wow. And the next really easy to run. Every step after that yeah. was, I didn't even notice how I got home. And each step after that got easier as you went yeah. along? Wow. And how did you feel inside as those steps become easier and easier? Oh, it was great. 
great feeling, yeah. a great feeling, yeah. Yeah, I bet that was a great feeling. And then you uh, finally came, came home, and did you have an afterglow after you ran off that out, or something else happened? No, and then it was again a normal day. And so as soon as you got home, kind of ended. So there's that special moment when you're incredibly tired, you don't want to take another step, and somehow something inside you opens up. Yes. It opens up, and it becomes so easy. Yeah. It's nice to know you can do that, isn't it? Yep. It's How do you feel right now? Feel okay. You feel good? Okay. Compare that to, notice what he, you offered me at the beginning, it's problems. I'm not revivifying those because I don't need to. There's not a resource there. Now, uh, do we just do, uh, we won't be doing this here just because we, we, we won't have time, but do we need to go a little bit further with this just so you can kind of see how I may work with this, right? So um, you're a doctor, is that right? Yes. And you get a little tense and you get, you were talking about this heart palpitation, is that right? Yes, yeah. When does that happen? Oh, that was when I was a student. When you were a student? Yes. Oh, because you're studying other people's problems so much, you start taking them on side. Yeah, I understand that. It happens and often, right? It always kind of keeps me going into those problems. Remember Tell me more. Oh, oh, oh I see, I see. Event. So every time you have a, a, a patient, because you remembered how bad it was as a student, you're a little afraid to interact with them. Is that right? No, I'm not afraid. It's kind of more cautious. You're more cautious because you don't want to have the experience that way again, that's right? I don't go into Yeah, that's interesting. And what would you like to have happen? Would you like to be able to go to those places without having those symptoms? Yes. Is that some sort yeah. of thing? Yeah. Not to, not to get those symptoms. Not to get those symptoms. I never had it. After yeah, that, yeah. Not because I was yeah. kind of holding myself back. So here's what I find really interesting. Do you mind if I share something with you? Sure. You had an experience which was unpleasant as a student, and as a result, you know, you kind of were more cautious with investigating problems. It hadn't happened since, of course, but. A few years ago, if it was about five years ago, you said you had this amazing running experience. The thing I find really interesting is you didn't get to that amazing space, you didn't, that, that thing didn't open up until you were in trouble. You couldn't run another step, you were really pushing yourself, and that's the point at which your unconscious mind opened up, isn't it? You're right. Yeah, so I'm wondering, if you've missed the opportunity to open up with your patients. Because just when you get to their biggest point of pain, maybe you both can open up together and have this amazing experience where everything's so easy and they don't even understand how they could have had that problem before. You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah, I'm getting there, but yeah. I always I have that in the mind, back of my mind. You always have in the back of your mind. Where is the border? Shouldn't I say Where is the border? border? Yeah. Where was the border when you're running? Yeah, there you go. Because mm -hmm. you don't know where the border is. No. But the border knows where it is. And somehow when you reach the border, that's when you opened up. What if? What if, as a medical student, you just hadn't given yourself the opportunity to open up yet? At that point, I wouldn't know what it is. you wouldn't know what it was, right? Whereas now, with the benefit of wisdom, experience, age, and so on, what if you could be with your patients and know that the more troubles they bring, the more of an opportunity you have to open up and show them how they can open up the way you did? Wouldn't that be an amazing transformation for them? That would be great. Wouldn't it? So as you think of that, what happened to that concern about getting too engaged with the client? You know, I mean, the one in the back of your mind. What happens to that? Um, it's it interesting, isn't it? It works a lot of times, but yeah. still I have that feeling that where is the, where is the point? Should where is the point? Yeah. So do you really need to know where the point is? Or do you need to allow yourself to find out? Maybe to allow. Yeah? How, are you, uh, you, how, how do you become a doctor? Oh, that's a long story. A lot of work, right? Mm. Number of mistakes? Always. If a junior doctor came in and asked you, well, how do you know when to do that? What's your answer? Be careful and do it. Be careful and do it, and do it right? See what happens. See what happens. Not to harm. Not to harm. You have to let things open up. So you've got to be careful. Absolutely. 
and you just have to do it. But you have to pay attention. Always. So you don't have any harm. Always pay attention. And then maybe you can, I'm sure you've had experiences where you help your patients open up, have you not? Yes. Right? Because you were paying attention and you yes. found the moment where they could open up and you just invited them in there, right? Yep. Usually was the case. Do you think this is going to be, have something to do with what you want? Always do that. Yeah. So you think of it like that. What happens to the concerns you had about, you know, talking about clients' problems? No, I think I'm getting there. You're getting there now, right? Yeah. It's kind of like that run where you had to struggle, really struggle at first. And it's at a point where you couldn't take another step, where your conscious mind had exhausted everything you could possibly do. And the conscious mind is so limited. So limited. And that's, that's when you're opened up. And do you know why you opened up? Well, it's interesting to know. Because you chose to be there and to continue on. You weren't frightened of that last step. You could have stopped at any time. Yeah. But you didn't. No. You didn't just leave it there. You didn't leave it as a failure. You continued on carefully. And that's when it opened up. That's when it opened up. I wonder in how many ways you will open up now that you can be more careful about your concern, but still do it. Okay. Just like a professional should, right? What do you reckon? Yep. I don't know, you tell me, any concerns? I think I have to work on it a bit. You have to work on it a bit, mm -hmm. yeah? But I got the momentum. You got the momentum now, right? So it's just a question of time to let us sort of settle in and so on? Yeah. yeah. So would you prefer taking a few minutes now to let us settle in, or would you want to do the exercise and let your unconscious mind deal with it? Does that answer your question, by the way? Yes. Yes? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Give me a round of applause, guys. That's using reification therapeutically, right? However, we won't have time here to go through the full version of that. I'm just trying to show you how to find the reasons in the first place. The key here is, um, well, the question he was asking, I thought originally was about accidentally revivifying problems, but it wasn't. It was more about a personal obstacle. And this is a great example of how you use revivification as a resource to dissolve personal obstacles, personal hurdles along the way. Does that make sense? Right? And this is a wonderful example as well, and thank you so much for coming up and doing that. I appreciate that. Because notice how... If I was arrogant, I'd push him as a therapist to say, no, I want you to tell me that you're done and you're fixed and you love me because otherwise I feel bad, right? Let's face it, we've all done that at some point, right? Whereas he's actually given me exactly what he needs. I've got it now. Now I need to work on it myself. Great. Go ahead and do that, right? Because some things do take some time for things to settle in, filter out, and make sure everything is taken care of, right? Now... Um, you know, if he comes back for a second session, I can check in, how did that go? And if it fell apart, no big deal. We were almost there last time, so we can now finish up this time. So if you're not in a hurry, you know, it's the old saying, you've got to slow down to hurry up, right? Because otherwise, you have the other saying, which is more haste, less speed. Do you get how this works? Yeah? Any questions or comments on that? We have eaten a bit of time, so we'll see if we can catch up in a minute. Yeah, we're still okay. Any questions or comments on what we just saw here? Yes? Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to see more like that. <laughs> You'd like to see more like that? <laughs> well, you have to work first. <laughs> right? Um, my, my aim here today is to give you the core skills to achieve that in due course. But get, let's get the foundations right, right? If we think too far ahead, then it blocks you being able to take the next step. And so far, the steps have been really easy, haven't they? And right now, you probably are thinking, oh, my God, I don't know if I can do that, which means you've just jumped ahead again. So go back to what's easy. That point becomes really easy to get to if you take it one step at a time, right? And it's just, just focus on the next step. That's my encouragement there. Yes, sir? How much of that is close to the meta pattern that I've read about? So how much of that is over meta, close to the meta pattern or the uh, PCAT formula, depending on which you know, school you're looking at? Um, well, the whole point of the meta pattern is that it's, it describes how all change occurs, in which case it has to be the same, right? <laughs> Got a problem? Get a resource, attach resource to the problem, find out if it worked. That's the simplest way of looking at change. Is that what I saw there? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. 
right? Would I, if thinking back on it now, is that not the pattern we ran, yeah. right? Note, what I didn't do is revify the problem because he's in it enough. I, I, I can tell that he's upset by it, and that means it's lit up. That's enough. As soon as I start talking about resources, they will just bleed over, right? Think of it this way. Let's say you're doing, uh, you do, doing classes with ex-cons, and they're all tough and mean and they hate life and whatever. I'm stereotyping, I'm sorry. If you're an ex-con, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then right after, when the hour ends, you have another group coming in, and these are all, you know, hug tree hippies and love and wonderful world and so on. Only you haven't kicked out your old group e e in enough for the new to come in. Now they're both in the same room. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to influence each other, right? The ex-cons may be a little bit less upset, and the hippie's going to be a little bit more down to earth. It's like, OK, all right. You get the idea? And this is essentially what we're doing. If you do it just on its own, it will automatically start eroding or changing the perception. What we just did here is we enhanced our effect. We compressed it. And you'll note it took about three or four rounds to do it. And ultimately, the problem wasn't the, the, the experience, the feeling you had. The problem that actually kept it locked in place was a belief. It was a thought, right? So we now use the, use the logic of his own experience to undermine the belief that was keeping him blocked. And now he has a resource, because now in the same way, his running becomes a metaphor. I mean, this is what we'll be talking about in the storytelling class, of course. His running has become a metaphor for how to resolve the concern, the fear about taking on a client's problem. Because structurally, they're the same. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you see how that works? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions before we carry on? No? OK. So with your partners, what I'd like you to do, we, we've had a chance to have uh, the pausing, right? And that's worked overall, but it introduces an element of awkwardness, does it not? Yes? Come back to me. No, I find totally fine. Or yes, it was a little more awkward than just a regular conversation, right? So how do we deal with that awkwardness? The solution I'm going to offer you, and it's not the only solution, but it's a good solution, is what I call the echo effect, right? And I'll combine that with what I call the Columbo approach. Anyone here know the TV detective Columbo, <laughs> right? And you know how he always like goes, oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful. She has one question, <laughs> right? That is essentially what we're doing here, right? Um, can I just borrow someone to just do this very quickly which to get a sense of what I mean? Anyone? Sure. Yep. Give me a round of applause. We'll do, we'll do this standing just for the sake of ease. Right? So give me the chance experience. What, what chance experience were you working on? Oh, years ago, 78, a friend of mine put me in a trance. I was out for Wonderful. three hours. Wonderful. Three hours. So it's years ago. Yes. And do you see already happening? And it's, a, it's just like a, it's a friend of yours, is that right? Yes. Notice the expression. It's not a friend of yours, right? which would be taking an emotional risk. It's a friend of yours, is that right? It looks like I'm checking in. How do you feel when I check in? Oh, what, you want to help me clarify. He's helping me because I'm the poor idiot counselor who's got a memory problem, right? <laughs> so it's a few years ago, right? And, and, and you, you, were you in a formal hypnotic context? or No, I was at their house. My sister was there. Oh, got it. So you were at someone's house? Yes. No, notice how he wants to run on. He wants to run on to tell the story, which will be the conscious part of the story, but I want the unconscious part of the story. So note how I'm slowing down again. So you're at your sister's house? No, I'm no, no, at sorry. my friend's house, my sister's. Got there. it. You're at your friend's house, yeah. your sister's there, mm -hmm. and you're with your friend. Then what happens? She asked me if she could hypnotize me. I said so, so, yes. So the friend is, is, is a female, and she asked you if she can hypnotize you? Yes. And you said yes. I did. Wonderful. And what happens then? I lie down on the couch. So you lie down on the couch, yeah. And she asked me to relax all my muscles. Do you see his eyes, by the way? Do you see how he's beginning to internalize his attention? If you want to come forward, come forward and see this. Because he's actually going in and out of trance. He's fractionating himself as we're talking about this. So if you're in the back and can't see, please come forward so you can see this. You can feel a little bit of that, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? But notice I'm pulling back out of trance now because I'm having a regular conversation. Do you see how chit-chat... It's called phatic communication. Chit-chat, if it's just surface level, it's a ritualized communication and becomes essentially meaningless, right? Although it has, a, it has a valuable social function to play. But it pulls them out of deeper trance experiences. Now, I'd like you to pay specific attention to his face and where his eyes are doing. Because eyes, you know they're saying the eyes are windows for the soul? In this case, eyes reflect mental processing, right? You know when someone's erratic because the eyes are doing... 
What's going on in my mind right now, right? A bad LSG trip maybe, <laughs> right? So my eyes are telling you how I'm processing the world. If I'm, you know how I'm processing the world because of my facial expression and particularly what my eyes are doing. Would you say my attention is internalized or externalized that second time? Internalized, internalized right? Would you say the internal experience is overall pleasant or unpleasant? So you already have all you need to know this is working, right? So you're with a friend and with your sister at your friend's house. And she asks you, you want to be hypnotized? And mm -hmm. you say, oh yeah. And you lie on the couch. And yes. And then what happens? She asks me to relax my muscles. She asks you to relax your muscles. Mm -hmm. Relax your muscles. Mm -hmm. and where do you begin? Is it the I shoulders? I think at the shoulders, yeah. Yeah. yeah this is How do we know that? His unconscious already told me. <laughs> his conscious mind doubts, but his unconscious mind has no doubt. Do you see how this is going on? It yeah, starts it in the shoulders, 1978. right? 1978. That was a long time ago. 1978. Wow, a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. Yeah. And you're on the couch. Yes. And she's asking to relax yourself. And you begin relaxing yes. your shoulders. Yes. Did you hear the tone? Is he relaxing? So you're relaxing your shoulders, right? Yes. Does it continue from there? All the way down to my feet. All the way. Yeah. All the way. Yeah. All the way down to your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? Thank you so much. Thank you. Give them a round of applause, guys. As you settle yourself down, let me ask you this question. Put yourself in the mindset before you ever came across hypnosis. Can you all do that for a moment? Yes? Before you had ever learned anything about hypnosis. You're a completely lay person. Hypnosis is a mystical thing. You have to be born with special powers, that sort of thing, right? Now, let's assume you watched a videotape or maybe you sat in a room where we were having a conversation, and you just happened to be in, maybe in the next booth or something along, and you just happened to be overhearing or overlisting our conversation. How many of you would have thought that that sounds just like a really interesting conversation versus, oh, he's doing something weird, and he's probably doing some weird culty shit with him, right? I apologize for my French. <laughs> what would you have thought? Do you think this is a culty sort of crazy thing? Hands up if you think it's culty and crazy. Hands up if it sounds like a regular conversation, right? So. Um, I'd say uh, this was a more dramatic version of conversation hypnosis, absolutely, right? So the thing that brought you over the, the edge a little bit, and it will happen, by the way, right, um, is also partly to do with your own... Uh, are, you, are you comfortable doing conversation hypnosis in public settings? I have not practiced well. Right. Are you, have you any concerns about it, or you'd be happy to just try it out? Okay, cool. So um, I encourage you to try it out and notice that a huge many more people will actually not even notice it's going on. You'll be very surprised at that part. And whilst you're right that this was a slightly more intimate conversation than usual, it's that intimacy you might be responding to. Does it make sense to you guys? And it's very important you realize something. And this is, this is I want to really hopefully embed this inside your mind. Hypnosis is anything but a casual relationship. It's a very deep relationship. It can be a very meaningful relationship. And sometimes it can be invasive. There are times to be able to do that, and there are times when you don't do that, right? If I'm sitting at a bus stop, and it's a complete stranger, he will tell me how comfortable he is with how deep he can go. This is a more artificial context, right? And he'll tell me by drawing back if I get too intimate too soon. Now, this is where more strategic stuff comes in, and we do not have time to look at that today. But to give you the quick solution to that, that's when you start fractionating. You start, you do a little bit of intimacy, and you go back to chit-chat. The way you guys are doing. And then you go back to more intimacy, and you start chit-chatting. After four or five cycles, they'll let you go a lot further than they would otherwise have done. Does that kind of solve the concept, or the idea around being too emotionally pushy? Yeah. Which is really with the culty niche that you were referring to, right? And you're right, we, we need to be very respectful. Um, there are people who are really afraid of their emotions and they're really afraid of, of showing themselves to other people and so on. And with those people, you've got to be much, much more delicate about doing this stuff. And in an everyday situation, you may want to just back off and just do other things instead because the reification process is a powerful process which may overload them initially. And they may need to have other wins first before they feel emotionally safe enough with you to do the next step. Does that make sense to you guys? So uh, I, I hope this puts you in, a, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. I hope this gives you a bigger context where these skills sit inside of. We don't have time to explore all of them. I just want to give you the workhorse that'll work 
in 90% of the cases, and no, it will fail at some point, and you'd have to add principles to resolve whatever broke. Right? Does that, does that help you guys? Yeah? Yes? So would you say that you should never do that with the first session? So the question is, would you say that you should never do that with session? I'd say the inverse. I'd say I would probably do it with every session. And only once I say get signals that, I'm, that, that this person is uh, too uncomfortable, would I start backing off? Would you like to see what it is? Yeah? Someone asked me one of the uh, questions about a, a, a trans memory. Anyone? I'm going to be the person that's going to get too inhibited, so you can have to back off. I'm going to role play that. Uh, well, I, um, I, I, I went to a hypnotist in a stage show, and um, he, um, what, 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 why, why are you asking? <laughs> Do you continue with the reification at this point? <laughs> no. There's other stuff that needs to happen first. The context is not healthy yet, right? This is when you switch to the other stuff. I think you were there at the hypnotic intent class creating a hypnotic context and all that stuff. That's where that stuff starts coming in more until they give you permission to enter their inner world, their private world more, right? I, I can't cover all those contexts in this short class like this. I can give you the raw skill. And you're absolutely correct. There are times when you'll need to pause before you do this. And there are times when you need to do other things to set yourself up for permission to do this. But that's something for uh, the diploma course, for example, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with those things. Right? Does that help? Any other questions on that? Was this useful to you guys? Did you enjoy the demonstration? Yeah, right? When you, do this, um, when you do this well, when you get accustomed to this, people will literally forget where they are whilst they're talking to you. Let me ask you this. It probably happened to you a little bit. For a while, whilst we were talking about that memory, did you kind of lose track of this room? You kind of knew people were there in the back of your mind, but more interest to you was the memory and how it was coming up inside you. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Then I became very aware. Of course. And then I went right back. Right. And that's because I kept talking to them. And every time I talk to them, I remind you that them, they exist. <laughs> right? What that is called, by the way, is a negative hallucination. And I broke my negative hallucination by talking to you guys. It's the, it's the opening salvo of a negative hallucination. It's not the full-blown version. Right? But like everything else, it's a sliding scale. Right? So we got, we're getting full-blown hypnotic phenomena here in a conversation. And it's really straightforward when you know what you're looking for, is it not? Yes? Yes? Can you start it so you don't screw up the... Regular memory? Yep. Which put me right back at that hypnotic state. Mm -hmm. And then when we went back, the last one, it changed everything. Now I'm very much into thinking about... Okay, so it's just to summarize for the group. When you first did the... Uh, were asked about your trance experience, it was wonderful, it was natural, and you were totally in it. And in this last round, you went into a much more of a thinking state, is that right? Yeah, because I started way from the beginning, not where I went into the hypnotic state. Right. Well, it's a question of slowing down at the point where the transition happens. If you spend more time on all the stuff that happens before the hypnotic state, mm -hmm. then you may well be asking them to be more awake or more alert, right? That might be part of it. The other part of it might be, because we're doing a training program right now, you're really thinking about how to apply this, and that's engaged the other part of your intellect. Once your partner starts asking you questions again, and we'll talk about the formal structure of that in a moment, you should find yourself slipping back into it because it's so much nicer remembering that than thinking about remembering it. You get the idea? Okay. Any other concerns or questions before we rock on? All right, so let's do this. So... We know we want to add pauses, right? And you saw the power of pauses, is that correct? And you'll notice how clients always want to run on, and your job is as respectfully as possible to stop them, so that each little unit, you, you see how I had very small packets of information. I was here, it was a long time ago. I was with my sister, each one is an extra packet. And he wants to tell me more of the scene, he wants to set more of the scene, but I'm actually pausing him, because I'm teaching him, or he's unconscious, how I expect him to give me the story, which is more unconsciously. Does that make sense? Now, yes, sir. So, at what point is the less way to story than the sacrifice? Yeah. Can we let the client tell the whole story? In here, in here, no, because of time reasons. In real life, it's a judgment call, right? Um, sometimes they just need to get the whole story out so they can just, just 
vent and just, just let it out there, right? And if you interfere too much, it's some people get frustrated by the interference, in which case they can tell the whole story and then they'll go back to clarify, right? For most people, however, they're very happy to pause in the middle of the story and answer a detailed question, which is essentially what we've been doing, and then they'll go into the, the trans experience much more quickly than that. It's just a question of what person you have in front of you. Does that help? Right? So we want to pause, and the key skill for helping you pause and making it socially acceptable is the echo effect. Remember, we're doing this with a Colombo approach. Essentially, you're going to take the packet of information they just gave you, and you're going to reflect it back as, as uh, uh, precisely, as closely to what they said as possible, whilst, and this is important, still maintaining a conversational framework. Right? So for example, when did this uh, trance occur? 1978. So it's 1978. Right? I added the so, didn't I? 1978. Okay. So it's 1978, and uh, where was this? This was in Danbury, Connecticut. So notice my questions are just normal orienting questions. Where are you? When are you? I'm getting a sense of the whole scene, right? But already I'm training him to go into the trance with me. Do you see how that's working? And I'm re echoing back. So it was in where? In uh, Danbury, Connecticut. In Connecticut, in Danbury, Connecticut. Okay. Great. So you're a friend's house in Danbury, Connecticut, right? It's 1978. You're at your friend's house. See all the scene setting I'm doing? It looks like I'm trying to set the scene for him so I can understand, but I'm actually echoing it back to him. Now, my initial echoes are a little bit more conversational, aren't they? Because he's, he's not in the actual fully immersed experience yet. He's just setting the scene for me. But it's still bringing the whole memory trace up in his mind. So by the time we get to the actual trance experience, it starts popping out much more intensely. Does that make sense to you guys? And I can even skip at this point because I know I've already got him involved in the conversation. So at some point you mentioned lying on the bed and then you were starting to relax, right? Yeah, I was on the couch. In the You're on a couch, I apologize. Yeah. You're on a couch. See, so his correction of me is great because it gives you an opportunity to echo back. So there's a couch mm -hmm. and you're lying on the couch. Yes. Your eyes closed or open? Closed. So your eyes are closed. Did you see his unconscious reaction there? Closed, right? And you started relaxing from around the shoulders. And then what happened? And see how I've already slowed down, how quickly I've gone right to the nub of it? So the scene setting just gives me permission for this style of talking. And by the time I get into the middle of the experience, he actually wants me to shut up more so he can enjoy it more. Do you not? Mm -hmm. Right? Because let me show you what not to do. Is that OK with you guys? So it's 1978. You're with your friend in your friend's house. Now, go be there now, go lie on that couch and start relaxing and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's totally different. Totally different. <laughs> because I haven't allowed him the fundamental quality that will make the experience trance-like, and it's the pauses to process the experience. I haven't given him time to have the experience. I'm rushing him. The other one sees mechanical and like a technique that you do. It is a technique. Yeah. So is this, but in a different way. And the point is, it should feel natural. You should be just uh, this, uh, approaching with the spirit of adventure. You're a detective trying to find out, what's this story? OK, this is fascinating. Tell me more. <gasps> so go back a little bit. I missed a step. So how do you get from this step to that step? Do you feel that long pause, how it sucks him in? Right? So I'm giving you the, the basic building blocks, but you can do elaborate. You can do lots of really cool things with this. So right now, I think it's time for an exercise to actually experience this, and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about it. Do you all get a sense of what to do in the exercise, or does anyone have any questions about doing this as an exercise? Everyone cool? All right, guys, with your partners, a formal trance experience, and then just see what happens. Off you go. All right, guys, welcome back. How was that? Was that interesting? Yes. Do you notice how the echo and the pausing really enhance the experience? Yeah? Did you guys find, specifically because I know you felt like interrupting before, did you find this now, because you let them gaps to experience that portion, did it enhance it or detract at this point? Enhanced. It enhanced much more, right? Yes. Good. And the reason is because before you were interrupting their flow, you were pushing her off her swing, whereas now that you're pausing and echoing, you're actually pushing the swing, so it intensifies. And it's really a question of timing and then leaving them to have a momentum to have a full swing, and then you jump in again on the next swing, right? And that's a little bit of a, it's a nice metaphor, but it's a nice, uh, it takes a little bit of a practice just to get the, the feel for it. And you usually know, because if you push too hard, 
then it, the conversation suddenly feels awkward again, which is the thing I think you felt before. Yeah, but does that answer your question now? Yeah. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments on what you just did? Was it straightforward? Are you noticing how as we were progressing, adding a few uh, extra tools into our conversation, it gets more hypnotic, yes? So I'd like to talk about another tool now, and that's this idea of being a role model, right? A role model. You want, you want to uh, teach them how to interact with their memory in order to revivify it, which means you're teaching them to pause by pausing. Do you know what happens there? Did you want to fill in the silence, right? Did you want to have the experience by any chance? So you know you can pause and still run the conversation without people interacting with you, right? Now I'm doing it more dramatic now because I'm talking at a faster pace than totally stopping. It becomes much more natural when you go first, when you become a role model, when you begin to open up a little trance inside yourself, where you really get to appreciate their experience. Can you feel how internally everything's getting a little quieter? It's because I'm role modeling for you. I am showing you how I'd like you to interact with my information right now, right? It doesn't mean you will automatically join me, no. But if I got my relationship set up correctly at the beginning, it's respectful, there's a good rapport going on, we're doing a little bit of mirroring and matching, and all that stuff is happening unconsciously, then they'll want to join me there. You get the idea? Yes, sir. Thank you. So just to tell uh, sort of everyone else in here as well, so he's saying he felt that this time around, using the echo effect, he had more power to control the direction of the conversation, and so he enhanced it much more because you could pick and choose the most potent portions of the experience, right? And I agree with you 100%. That's exactly how it works, which is really indirectly the answer to your question as well, at least the one I thought you asked initially but weren't actually asking entirely. And that's the idea of you don't revivify problems, you'll skirt around them. You just stick to the things that will enhance or empower them. After all, this is not evil hypnosis school. This is not how to revivify trauma so that everyone cries and weeps and uh, wants to commit suicide in your presence. This is the, uh, this is the good hypnosis school, the happy fairies, right? It's about, it's about life-affirming, empowering experiences that you can then use in other areas of their life so they are more potent, they have a better light, they're more personally powerful. You get the idea? Any questions on that so far? Yes? I, I'm running into a lot of I don't knows, I don't remembers. You don't knows, is this your, is this your partner? Yes. Do you mind if I talk to you directly about this? Because it's after his mind. Um, so, um, what was the memory you were talking about? Uh, about a trance state in a conference. A trance state in a conference, right? When was this tr uh, conference, roughly? Why did I say roughly? If I say, watch this. So exactly when was this, um, uh, this experience? I don't remember exactly. <laughs> right? It was, roughly, it was roughly a year or so ago, is that right? Yeah. So what happened? Uh, we were out in the foyer talking, uh, okay. going through an exercise. So you were out in the foyer, you were talking, going through an exercise, right? And then what happened? Um, it was probably the first time I really felt like I going into a fairly deep trance. Wow. So it's the first time you ever felt like you're going to a deep trance, is that right? Wow. What was that like? Uh, like a, a wave of, uh, I mean, it was almost like I was doing it myself. It wasn't him. Wow. So it's like you were doing it yourself. It was like a wave. A wave, and you're doing it yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And compare that to, uh, so you're in this, uh, you're in the foyer with these people. So exactly, who's around you? There were six of us sitting in a, an area. Okay, I, I've made a, a rod for my own back now because I've revived it too well. The information's going to start coming back now. But you see what's going on here. What you're experiencing is a, is, is a result of pressure, 
right? So give me an example of something you didn't know about the memory that you had problems with here, and we'll show you how to fix that, right? Uh, as, as what? Yeah, or something you said he didn't know uh, uh, too. Oh, right, right, right. So who picked who for the strands? I don't remember. Right. Right? Because it's very precise information, right? So watch this. So you're in that, in a, in a foyer or a lobby, is that right? Yeah. And you're with about six other people, yeah. right? And everyone kind of pairs off. Everyone chooses someone to do work with. Is that right? Correct. And you choose someone, right? Uh, or they choose you one way or the other? Right. right? I'm not even making you do the choice. So you have your partner, and do you, and you know how they began? Or do you just find yourself in that place? No, we, uh, uh, he suggested to go out to the foyer. He suggested to go out to the foyer, right? He suggested to go out to the foyer. And then what happened? Oh, we sat down in these overstuffed chairs. And so you're sitting on these overstuffed chairs in this foyer, and this gentleman is starting to talk to you, is that right? And then what happens? Uh, it was a direct hypnosis presentation, so we went through a fairly uh, quick uh, process. So you did a quick hypnotic process. Correct. And is that when you felt that wave, or? No, as we started into it, yes. As you're starting into it, you're sitting in that plush chair. Are your eyes open or closed at this stage? I believe they were closed. So your eyes are closed. And you're sitting in the chair. This other gentleman is talking to you, and already you're beginning to feel, really feel, a wave of, you know, and that's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Right? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. So there are two things that come out of that. One is, did you all see me role model what I ex how I expected him to engage with information. It's very different than I say, okay, so in the, you're on the sofa over there, you're chatting and you're, your eyes are closed and the guy's talking to you and you have this wave, right? <laughs> it doesn't give him a chance to process anything. Now, at this point, he might be able to go back to it because I just finished revivifying that and he's still in that glow, right? But for the most part, that's what makes it difficult. The second thing that, that would, can make it difficult is being over precise, right? Because memory is fallible. So as soon as, as soon as I come across something that's a little difficult for them to remember, I'll fudge it. So some who picked who, I don't know. Okay, but people were picking each other, right? Yes. And everyone else paired off, correct? Yes. And you paired off with someone. I want someone specific, someone. And very often, by the way, do you remember who this person is yet? No. No? But you know it's a man, right? Yes. You know it's a man. Did he have a beard? I don't remember. You don't remember yet, do you? No. Did you like his mannerisms, though? Did you enjoy the way that he talked to you? So, yeah. yeah. It was a pleasant trance experience after all, right? Yes. Yeah. Was he wearing casual clothes or suit? Casual. So the casual clothes. It's a pleasant person. You don't quite remember what he looks like yet. No. No, but it's starting to get a little clearer, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But it's okay, you don't need to remember exactly what he looks like now. All you need to do is remember the whole experience and it was pleasant, right? And you know he's wearing casual clothes. Was by casual you mean like t-shirt and jeans or something else? Say that again. By casual, do you mean t-shirt and jeans or do you mean something else? I don't know, I see a vest. You see a vest, right? Like this sort of vest? Yeah. Okay, so you see a vest. Is there a shirt with that vest or just a t-shirt? Shirt. So there's a shirt. And do you recall the color of that shirt? No, it just have a sh sort of shirtness quality to it, right? So you know there's a shirt, you know there's a vest. Do you have any sense of what the pants were like? More jeans, more suits, more formal, informal? No, more aware of the surroundings. More aware of the surroundings, right, right. Now we're going into a completely different track now. We're now getting to more forensic hypnosis to start revivifying, to re record, uh, basically hypermnesia. We're trying to recall details. But honestly, in terms of the revivification, those details are irrelevant. I just want enough details for the experience to come back, even though we can keep pursuing that. And you'll notice, you've noticed, would you be fair to say in your experience, 
did the memory start becoming clearer and clearer as I asked these, these non-pushy but precise questions, right? And this is how you, it may take an hour, it may take two hours, but the point is we're slowly pulling back memory traces. But that's not what this seminar is about. That's forensic hypnosis, and it's really mostly relevant for most um, therapeutic contexts or even influence contexts. Uh, so I want to stick to this model, but I wanted to answer your question anyways. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, it's about resources. The resource could be emotional, the resource could be intellectual, right? For him, it was an understanding that before this big breakthrough comes a moment of exhaustion or a moment of, I just, uh, this is too much, right? And as soon as he put the two together in a positive way there, it creates a metaphor for it over here. Those kind of metaphors is what we'll explore more uh, in the storytelling class. This is beyond the scope of this. But you see how everything starts blending into each other now, and each unit then supports the other units to create a really powerful structure, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions here? Okay, the other thing you may have spotted is that I changed my tense halfway through from the past tense to the present tense. Any ideas why? Yeah. To put them into it more, right? When, when you experience things, do you experience them now? I'm telling them, have more of a now experience. So, you are lying on the couch, right? Well, I lay down on the couch. Okay, so you lay down on the couch, and what happened? Well, she told me to close my eyes and start relaxing. Okay. So you are lying on the couch. Do you feel, see the transition? You are closing your eyes. She invites you to relax. And then what happens? Do you see? How, it's a very simple transition to make. They wouldn't even catch it, but it orients them much more presently. You get the idea? No. Any questions about those four steps? No? Pretty easy, pretty straightforward? Yes? I'd like to do another exercise to get these four steps down, but I'd like to show you how to use this now. Because we're running out of time, I want to make sure we, we jump to the end point here. Um, you may have noticed that, so what's your name? Iva. Iva? Iva, yeah. Iva. So you may have noticed with Iva, um, I didn't use a, did we use a formal, no, we didn't use a formal trance as a resource, did we? What did we use as the resource? Running, right? Did he still go into a trance? Did he still uh, revivify resources? Did those resources fix the problem? Yes? So did we do a piece of conversational hypnosis that worked? Yes? You get the idea? So you don't have to be stuck on trance things. We're using trance because it's formalized and it's easy to get your bearings. Now I want you to, now that this stuff is relatively straightforward, I'd like you to have a final conversation today with the person, but ask them about something that they enjoy. How do you relax? You know, what do you like doing? What hobbies do you have? Something that they find positive and pleasant. And as you're talking about that, see if you can start adding these things in until they start to obviously go inside and relive that experience more richly. Do you understand what I mean? Or would you like to have a quick demonstration of that? Demonstration? Yeah. Now, I'm happily going to do this demonstration, but because of time reasons, um, it may mean that you may only have one chance to do it one way around, and you'll have to do the other way around on your own. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Right? So, let's do a demonstration. And who would like to come up for this one? Anyone? Uh, <laughs> I should really start. I'm sorry, I can be enthusiasm like that. All right, give me a round of applause. Let's get some chairs up here, please. Now, I'm going to go all the way the other way towards a, a, a conversational revivification. Because now that you have the structure there, you should be able to spot most of what I'm doing. Is that okay with you guys? Right? So, what's your name, sorry? Deborah. Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Oh, we met the other day at lunch, right? We did. Excellent, cool. Excellent. So, you having fun here? I am. I'm so glad I came. Good. How come? Because I'm learning so much. Yeah. And it's great to come here and meet all the people that I only know awesome. on Facebook. And, but it's yeah. the learning, all the different ideas and different hypnotists. Yeah. And, yeah. I can see you're thrilled by that. Oh, I'm coming every year for the rest of the <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I believe that. <laughs> so, um, so what were some highlights for you? What was something you're going to take back and go, wow, that, I'm so glad I saw that? Well, I'm flattered, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Is there a specific thing in mind, or just generally glow with happiness? Everything. I'm getting everything. copies of the CDs for everything that I attended. Well, yes, I, I'm thinking more about what is it that you attended where you really had a sense of like, oh, this was really worth coming. If nothing else, then this was worth it. Every single thing. Yeah? Every single class. Right. Now, see how she's avoiding the specific topic? She's going to abstraction, mm -hmm. so, which is fine, by the way. Uh, so give me an example. Um, Do you see the trance beginning? Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. She's finding it because I force her out of her thought loops, which is abstraction, into more experience, by the example. And yeah. I remember yesterday's class. Okay, so yesterday's class, yeah. Yesterday's class where you were yeah. talking about the four principles of hypnosis mastery. Oh, okay, so we're the, oh yeah, I get it, that was a fun class, right? So it's yesterday, yeah. and we're talking about the four principles of hypnosis mastery, right? Yes, and the first one you were talking about finding your passion, do something right. you're passionate about. Right. And I'm so passionate about hypnosis. Right. And you were saying, it had something that's so, you're so passionate about that you'd be willing to do it for free, and I wow. thought, that's me. That's you. Wow. I'm doing it all for free. That's wow. the problem. <laughs> well, that, that, that could be a problem, but yeah. let's take the money side aside for a moment. Yeah. The realization sounds like it was a very powerful realization. Yeah. yeah. So you're, 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 you come here, uh, you came there to do what? To learn about mastering or just because you thought it would be interesting? Everything helped with marketing, hypnosis, Got it. you know, everything. So you, you're, sitting, you're sitting in the session to learn about mastering hypnosis so they can help you with every part of your hypnosis yes. practice. Yes. And already in the first key, which is about finding your passion, mm -hmm. you saw yourself in that, right? Oh, I definitely did. Yeah. I thought, that's, that, that's my payoff. That's why yeah. I don't care if I don't get money, because I'm passionate yeah, about it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's time out a little bit. Do you see how she yeah. keeps going off? to go into the memory, and the only reason she's coming back here is because I'm engaging her socially, mm -hmm. right? So now my next step is to remove myself a little bit from the social element. So, um, how did it make you feel? How, does what make you how did that make you feel when you heard about the passion oh. and you recognize yourself yeah. as a person that's passionate about hypnosis? Yeah. How did it make you feel? It made me feel Happy. This Happy. is truly my passion to right. help people. I can see that. Yeah. It is your passion. Yeah. I can see why you'd be happy about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Good for you. Good for you. Are you glad you came to that session? Definitely. All yeah. Of them. Now let's do another time out. Just uh, mm -hmm. for the rest of the audience. How are you feeling right now? Uh, nervous. Because <laughs> it's in front of the group. Because everyone else is. Because yeah. everyone's saying yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so at, at, the point, at this point, because she's passively listening to a lecture, it becomes a little less um, easy to engage her in something. We could do it, but I'm going to just switch track because it's a lot easier to something more, uh, more um, engaging, something she's active inside of, right? So what else? What's another highlight for you? What's something you experienced? In fact, you want forget about hypnosis. It sounds like you're quite a passionate person in general. Is that right? About yeah. Helping people. Yeah. So when you find your thing, whether it's hypnosis or not, it's something you get very passionate about. Yeah. What else are you passionate about? Um, animals. Animals. Yeah. yeah. What's it about animals that that makes you so passionate? I just love them. Yeah. What owning them or looking after them or even just passing one on the street and petting it. I I um, last time I came to Las Vegas for right. hypnosis training. I went to swim with the dolphins. Over you went to swim with the dolphins. Hotel. Wow. Yeah. So that tell me more. my dream to swim with the dolphins. Uh, I believe that. Yeah. So you, you were here, is it a year ago? Or yeah, longer? A year ago. So about a year ago? A year? No, two years ago. Two years ago. Okay, so you went to the very first one. So about two years yeah. ago, mm -hmm. you're in Vegas. And where, where did you go to, the, to see the dolphins? The Mirage Hotel. The Mirage Hotel, yeah. right? So what was it like entering the Mirage Hotel knowing that the, you know, you're going on your dolphin trip? Amazing, because I'd wanted to swim with dolphins since right. I was a little kid watching Flickr on TV. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So then you're, you're entering the, uh, the, the Mirage, and is it a far way to go to get to this pool area, or? Yeah, yeah, all the way through to the back of the hotel. So you're walking all the way through the back of the hotel. What's going through your mind as you're walking through a hotel? I'm finally going to swim with the dolphins. You're finally going to swim <laughs> with the dolphins. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So does the anticipation, does that excitement build up as you get closer? Yeah. 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 Let's pause a second again. Do you see now that we have, a, have a, a, an, an event she's engaging in rather than passively absorbing? Do you see how much more um, she lights up with it? The emotions easily jump in much more clearly. And she's, um, she's popping into trances much more naturally. You get the idea? Are you feeling that? Yeah. Did you forget these guys for a little bit? Yeah. You did, didn't you? Yeah. Right, so you, you, you're in the mirage and you're walking and your, your dream is finally going to come true. Mm -hmm. And the closer you get, the more, you know. Yeah. 
And then, and then what happens? How do you know when you, when you transition from formal hotel towards Dolphin Center? How do you know you're getting to the right place? Well, the guy who works there met, uh, they only let four people swim at the Dolphin Center. All right. So we, he met the group there and then he took him back through where the dolphins are. And as soon as we approached the water, ah, there you go. Oh my gosh, these two dolphins just popped right up out of the water and they just stood there looking at us. Where is she right now? <laughs> <laughs> But do you see, I don't even have to revivify the actual memory. It's my scene setting and my coaching on how to interact with the scene where she now she took herself there. Now, um, again, let me ask the question again. If this were, if you had no hypnotic training beforehand, what would this sound like? Conversation, Conversation right? Yeah. Right? If you had no hypnotic experience before, put yourself like you know, 20 years past or whatever, and someone had this conversation with you, what would that feel like? A really good conversation? Yeah. Would you say, oh, what are you doing? Which cult are you trying to recruit me to? Yeah. Would yeah. you do that? Or would you say, yeah. no, I'd be like, no, just keep asking. I'm liking this. Just yeah. talk more about me, right? Yeah. <laughs> but this is, this, is, this is how people feel. People, uh, there's actually an interesting research. People would, would uh, if, if people are given a chance to be really listened to, and you offer them cash or food in exchange for that, in other words, you can't have that listening anymore, but we'll give you cash, we'll give you this amazing meal, Guess which they choose? Being listened to. It is a, an incredibly um, powerful thing for human beings. You get the idea? And do you see how there's no formal trance here? She no, has no idea, so actually, of course, we are talking about it right now, that there's a trance involved here. Can you see the resource lit right up? And we're right now right back to what we did over here with Ivar in the sense that we have a massive resource that we can attach to anything. If it's uh, informal, uh, formal or informal, it doesn't really matter. Do you get the idea? Do, was this useful? Do you want to continue? We've only got about 10 minutes left, so if you want to have a, a chance of even trying this, we need to go off and do it. Otherwise, I can do a little more demo and we can talk about it a little bit more. It's entirely up to you how you want to handle it. A little more demo. A little more demo. So specifically, what would you like to get out of the rest of the demo? Say again? How you put them together. How, how do we use it? Well, first of all, I don't actually have a, a, a problem for something, but we'll have to dig for something. So tell me, what, what's some of the... Um, what are some of the um, things that hold you back in your career as a hypnotist? What do you reckon? I'm too willing to help people for free. You're too willing to I help people for like free. They're in hard financial times. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So you're too willing to help people for free when you're in hard financial times. Yeah. So you know that, right? Yeah. So what makes you? What prevents you from just saying, "Well, stop it. I won't do it anymore." I, I want to help people. You want to help people, well, right? Whether or not they have money to pay, I, I enjoy helping people. You enjoy people. helping people, understand yeah. that, right? So it seems like there's a, an interesting conflict there. You, you want to be paid, but yet you'd rather not be paid just so you can help someone. Is, did I it's miss something, something there? It's something I'm so passionate about, I'm totally willing to do it for free. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Were you passionate about the dolphins? Yeah. They didn't and let of you course, swim for free. <laughs> they didn't let you swim for free. So are you upset that you had to pay? Um, no. Why? Because at the time, I had the money to pay to go swim with the dolphins. And so right. when I see people that don't have the money to pay right. me, I right. want to help them anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. I understand. Does the Mirage ever do free dolphin tours like to kids, you know, with you know, who need like leukemia mm -hmm. and stuff like that? You know that charity where they have Make-A-Wish Foundation or something like that? They do. They do. I remember them saying that. Yeah. 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 And do you think those kids are excited and passionate about oh. the diaper too? Just like oh, yeah. you were? Yeah. 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 How do you think the, the hotel can afford to do that? Same way hospitals do. They overcharge the people that do pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> so that the people who can't pay for it can still get the care. It, it, isn't that the way you create a bit of social justice, oh. right? Yeah. And it's not that they overpay, because you know, you, the, the people that pay more maybe get extra value, a little bit more mm -hmm. personal attention. Yeah. The people that can't, yeah? yeah? I have a sense that you're thinking about something right now. Um, I don't want to overcharge the clients who can't afford to pay me to cover the ones Yeah, can. yeah. So we have now <laughs> the idea of overcharging it being an issue here, right? Yeah. But you see how quickly it's already collapsed? We just have that one little thing left over. Yeah. So what, what does overcharging mean to you? What, what, what does overcharging entail? Would it be an imbalance between how much they pay and how much they get in return? Is that, is that what overcharging would mean? No, like value for money type thing? Everybody so far gets 
um, what they wanted from the hypnosis. Yeah. So um, it's not that they paid for something they didn't get. I guess I feel like I'm overcharging if I charge more than what the local hypnotists are charging. Well, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I've been told I, I'm charging double. Yeah, that's good. So Congratulations. I wonder if I'm losing to paying clients because of that. But well, that's why they can't afford me, maybe well, because I charge double. Was Mirage, was it cheap? No. $500. You could have, you could have found so, it cheaper elsewhere. I don't know. So how come you went to the Mirage? Well, how I was come already you here in town for hypnosis training. Right. And how come you decide, well, 500 bucks is too much? Why did you not decide that? Um, or was the experience just too important for you? The experience was, yeah. yeah. I, I thought that was a deal compared to when I right. went to other places. That's interesting, yeah. that. It, was, it felt like a deal to you, yeah. right? You still paid a lot. Yeah. And those kids are still going free. Mm -hmm. But even though you paid a lot, it was a deal for you, right? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? You paid a lot, but it was a deal for you. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if that makes you think of something now. I don't know. In relation to your clients. I need to find clients who have enough money where what I charge yeah. is a deal. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm here right. to find those people. Yeah. I don't know and you know what? <laughs> how, long, how, long, how long did you spend with those dolphins? Oh, it was a lot less than I expected. It looked like on the schedule like you could swim with them for six hours straight. Right. You know, they let you five minutes here and then you come back right. for two hours of lunch. <laughs> right. And, and then they break again for lunch and, and then you ten do a minutes little bit more. here. Yeah. Like the dolphins can't handle that much yeah. constant human interaction. Yeah. Now, would you have liked to have spent more time with the dolphins? Oh, definitely. Now, if they, if they had to, because of course you have to take care of the dolphins, right? Yeah. And if they had to, um, you know, if they, if they decided they want to give people just more time, like a pure hour just with the dolphins, mm -hmm. but they don't want to stress them out either, right? Mm -hmm. They'd have to get more dolphins, wouldn't they? So what would that mean in terms of, you know, how much they would have to charge for that? Do you think it would go up a bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah? I didn't think of that before. Did, would be happy to pay extra just to get it in a whole hour and five minutes here or ten minutes there? Would you be happy to pay extra for that? Yes. Right. Because it makes you feel good, doesn't it? Yeah. It makes your dream come true, like the whole flipper thing. Yeah. And you can feel that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it's actually worth charging more so you can give more. Yeah. And then do you think the, the kids with leukemia may not be able to hang out there for an hour because they've got to make the money elsewhere, but they still have an amazing experience. Yeah. More than what so, they expect. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have a sense that you were... Um, I have a sense that when you go home, you're going to rethink your whole practice a little bit. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure why, but I think you, I think you know how to figure it out. Yeah. I'll, my unconscious will find a way to find yeah. the people that can afford to pay me double what right. my local competitors are charging. <laughs> right. And what about, is that, is that all? I mean, why would you stiff them on value? What if they want to spend more time with you? What if just one session is enough? Would it not be robbing them of time like you were robbed of time with the dolphins? Would you want to do that to them more no, wealthy clients? It's just they've come to me with a problem and it's fixed in one session. So right. Unless they have a new problem. Right? So, so what's the difference between what people want and what people need? How, do know, how does someone know they, they need something if, it's never ex if a solution for that has never existed before? Um, so I need to tell them, oh, I can fix this too then. Perhaps. I mean, if they don't know, right? Yeah, they, if they don't know right. what hypnosis can do. Right. Yeah. So what else is going on in your life? About? What else is going on in your life? Um, what else would you like to... Uh, I mean, obviously, the money side is one part of it, but it seems like there's other things that are hindering you. Is that right? Um, yeah. Did, did you enjoy how the whole money is decided to erode a little bit? Did you enjoy that part? Yes. Would you like to have more things like that? Do you think there's other areas in your life that could do with that kind of makeover? Yes. If you had a whole program that systematically went through all the obstacles in your life, the way we just did now, yeah. do you think that'd be worthwhile for you? Definitely. So you have a choice. We can either fix this, mm -hmm. or if you want, we can spend some time figuring out where all the obstacles in your life are right now, mm -hmm. and then we'll create a strategy to dissolve them all the way we did this. Would that be of value to you? Yeah. Yeah? Now, that comes at a charge. You realize yes. that, right? Because there's going to be a lot of work involved in doing that, yes. which I'll happily do. Yes. 
do we have any close to the same place as the dolphins right now? Yeah. Does that answer your question right now? Yeah. Does that answer your question right now? In that case, let's all sit back down because I think we're almost done. Give a round of applause, folks. <laughs> Very quickly, everyone, did you enjoy that? Was that useful to you guys? Yes? Do you now have some idea of how to A, do reifications, B, make them more conversational, and C, start applying them in your day to day lives, whether it's for formal therapeutic context or informal context, where you don't, can't put on your therapist's hat, uh, but you still want to help? Do you all have a sense of how to do that, right? Now, I, I appreciate we packed a lot of content in a very short period of time. I would love much more time to be able to unpack it all, but we don't have that. So those of you who want to follow that process further up with me, the two choices you really have right now is the storytelling we talked about earlier. You see how that fits in here very nicely. And the other thing is the diploma course, which is two years, well, of this sort of stuff, right? So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, make sure you pick up a form on the way out. Otherwise, is there any questions before I release you back into the wild? Or have you got everything you wanted? Yes, sir. Were you motivated? Oh, definitely. Were you inspired? Yep, by the dolphins. So, so like that. <laughs> <laughs> Other question, or are we good? Uh, very quickly, yes? So first you go with the positive. Absolutely. You, well, I, I, I'll start with what's the problem, what do you want to fix, just so I get a, a parameter, but I'm not going to revivify that. I'm looking for the big resource, and I'm bringing it back to that. So just a little bit of like, what's the problem, so I know I've got a real thing, big resource, and applied in any way, shape, or form that I can that she will accept, right? Very quickly, last question, what was it? Is it gone now? Sorry, oh, yes. When you're measuring back, are you giving like a better command? Yes. Especially when the ambiguous wording, like his was perfect, all the way down to my toes. I mean, come on, how can I resist that one? <laughs> okay, folks, I apologize for the timing running out, but you know, we have a tight schedule here. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>